All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Illinois EPA Office of Energy Public Water Infrastructure Energy Assessment Program webinar series. My name is Cassie Carroll. Um, I help promote the webinars, I help plants get assessments through the program, and I'm here to kick off today's event. So thank you for joining us for our first uh, one first part of a three-part series on aeration and energy. Today, we're gonna to do an introduction to aeration and energy, particularly for activated sludge systems. Um, we're specializing our webinars this year for different system types to make them um, make our educational events more relevant for your plant type and also uh, have for richer discussion. So thank you for joining us today. Um, again, this is part one of three webinars um, and the other two, we'll have another one in November and then another one in January along this series of aeration and energy. I'll be sure to follow up with you with that registration information if you have not yet registered for those events. Um, so today's webinar, um, we were gonna focus on just an introduction to aeration and energy. We're gonna be looking at um, not only things like oxygen transfer, um, but really digging into why uh, aeration is so important for our systems and why more aeration is not always better for treatment. Um, so we'll talk about um, nutrient removal, mixing, blowers, all sorts of different technologies and cover information across all these subjects um, to learn about the aeration basics. So I hope you enjoy today's event. I did wanna let you know too, that after the event, you will receive a certificate for participating in the event. If you'd like a certificate, please um, either email me, I'll pop my email in the chat, um, or put your name in the chat requesting a certificate and I'll get that to you. We will also have one CEU available for all of our operators on the line today. Um, the Illinois EPA has not provided a course number yet, but never fear. Um, they, they do here in the next couple of weeks, so I will send that when it is available. Again, I'll pop my email in the chat. Let me know if you'd like a certificate and a CEU course number. Finally, today our presentation will feature a lot of polls, so um, please get your mouses ready um, to participate in today's event. And with that, um, please also put your questions in the chat box or the Q&A box, and we will address all questions at the end of the webinar. All right, now to kick us off for today's event, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Jane McClintock. Thank you again for being here today and take it away, Jane. Thanks, Cassie. And thanks everyone for joining us today for this discussion of aeration and activated sludge systems. Let's see. Ah, here we go. So we are um, with the University of Illinois um, CDAC, the Smart Energy Design Assistance Center, and we work with the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center to, um, to provide um, energy assessments and support for water and wastewater plants across the state. And this um, webinar series today is part of our program. We are sponsored by the um, IEPA, the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency Office of Energy. So we wanna thank them for making this possible today. At CDAC, our goal is to reduce the energy footprint of Illinois and beyond. So our focus on wastewater treatment plants is a focus on energy. So we are looking at energy efficiency and wastewater, and today we'll discuss aeration with that focus in mind. So what we do, um, we do a lot of different things in um, various sectors, including water and wastewater, to help facilities become more energy efficient. So we focus on education research and advocating for sustainability. Our program, specifically our public water infrastructure program, provides energy assessments at no cost to public wastewater and water facilities and helps municipalities reduce the cost of water and wastewater treatment through lowering um, energy use and utility costs. The energy assessment, as I mentioned, is no cost to municipalities, and it's a comprehensive report listing costs of upgrades, estimating payback period, and all applicable incentives and funding opportunities. So we'll look into what um, the utility companies will be able to kick in to support the project and focus on um, not only the energy cost savings, but the return on investment. So you can identify um, and have conversations with your boards and um, municipal leaders about what would be the best investment. Also, as we're doing today, we offer some continuing education for operators. So thanks again for joining us. Also, the website is here, uh, cdac.org 
slash water or smartenergy.illinois.edu slash water. I think maybe Cassie can put that in the chat if you want to learn more, um, see some case studies or apply for an assessment. So why might you want to complete an assessment? For older plans, we're really able to identify missed opportunities, um, plan for capital improvements, um, help look for equipment upgrades that um, would benefit efficiency and identify those returns on investments. And also sometimes just look at ways we, that um, it might be possible to tweak the process without um, costly upgrades and uh, save on those utility bills. We also can provide a report which is easily uh, read by non-technical folks and so can support the wastewater treatment operator in um, discussing the upgrades and the importance of those upgrades and return on investment. For newer, more recently upgraded plants, it's still a good idea to get an assess assessment as there's always more room to improve. You can plan for future opportunities and look at new technologies. It's also a great way to benchmark your plant and make sure there weren't any missed opportunities in the upgrade or in the planned improvements. So always a great idea to do an assessment, no cost to the municipality. So if you haven't already, uh, please consider uh, applying for an assessment. And it's easy to do. There's just three simple steps. There's an initial application, which is kind of pre-qualification, ensuring that um, your plant is publicly owned, um, that you're all right with the University of Illinois visiting the site. Although we do offer um, remote site options, um, especially with uh, the current situation. And last year we've um, upgraded our video capabilities and ability to remotely identify the information that we need. So that's up to you. Uh, be willing to share facility information. So we need uh, you know, a little bit of data, but um, shouldn't be too onerous. And then uh, be, be willing to share the final assessment. Of course, you'll have the report, you can do what you want with it, but also uh, EPA is interested in knowing uh, what we were able to identify. And then data collection. This is, is a little bit of the information that we need from you to um, be able to do the energy assessment. Uh, discharge reports, which usually we're able to um, pull those from public records, but some of the process flows, um, you may need to, to ask you about some of that data. And the biggest one is just two years of utility bills um, so that we can see what kind of energy use you've had in the past. If you're, if you're on a larger utility, this can be pretty easy for us to, um, to assist you in um, pulling that data, but it can be a little bit, a little bit more difficult with um, smaller utilities, but we're here to assist. We're happy to work with um, your village offices or a municipal clerk to um, get this data and make it as easy as possible to uh, get the energy assessment with the best possible data and most accurate information. And then step three, we schedule a site visit and uh, we turn around the report for you in collaboration with you finding the measures that um, are of most interest to you to um, investigate and identify. So we're going to start with a quick uh, discussion today of why we aerate, which is going to be um, some basic um, basic stuff and some reminders. But we want to get on the same page before Sean dives us deep into the different technologies and different ways to control those technologies. Do so I'll quick discuss poll before you continue. Oh, did I miss the poll? Oh, thanks. Yeah, we, we do thanks, have one, Sean. Yeah, we do. We have a poll. <laughs> oh, thank you. See, this is what we we're afraid of. So have you had an energy assessment for your faci facility? Just a quick poll to see who uh, yeah, could just have been through a uh, utility, could have been through us, could have been through ISTC, who also partners with us on this PWI program, so. Yeah, rural water, there's lots of different opportunities. Great. Well, it's great to see that a lot of you all have already done an energy assessment for your facility. Okay. Looks like that's most of our respondents. Yeah. Fantastic. Almost 60% have had an assessment. Already. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Always room to re-up that benchmarking too and see how you're doing after you've implemented some measures, hopefully from your initial um, energy assessment. So jumping into the basics of why we, why do we aerate, which is you know, we're talking about aeration today because it's the biggest energy consumer in our wastewater plants. So what, what's, the, what's the reason for that? Why do we do it? And of course, we have carbon and ammonia, nitrogen in wastewater, which is coming from human activity. So humans produce these nutrients of concern. And 
the, we measure that as biological oxygen demand because microbes are breaking down those chemicals of concern in our wastewater. So we add, we add water to maintain dissolved oxygen levels in our wastewater to take care of those nutrients of concern. So we'll be talking about you know, what, kind of, um, what kind of nutrients do we have in the water, how much, and how much oxygen do they need? Usually wastewater is mostly it's carbon, um, about 100 parts per million of carbon to five parts per million nitrogen to one of phosphorus, which phosphorus we won't really discuss today as it doesn't um, require oxygen, but nitrogen is an important one to consider as it has a high um, demand for oxygen per, per unit. But BOD, biological oxygen demand, measures primarily the, the carbon, the largest uh, nutrient in our wastewater generally. We measure this in a five day, uh, BOD5, as I'm sure you all are aware, because we're looking at the impact that it has on streams and rivers as it's, as it's um, released from the wastewater facility. Most pristine streams have very low BOD and high dissolved oxygen. So wastewater release will have tend to have an effect of reducing the oxygen in the stream. If that's too much, we'll have um, effect on fish health and could, could potentially cause some uh, fish to suffocate and die. So we measure BOD over five days. And this has been, um, it's been said that the five day period is to emulate the, the time it would take from water to get from London to the ocean. Um, because we're trying to think about, you know, how much, how much impact is um, that those pollutants and therefore the microbial activity to break them down, what impact is that gonna have on our streams? And we'd convert that kind of concentration into a total number of pounds. So if we have a certain biological oxygen demand concentration, so a ratio of the wastewater is um, pollutants that need, that require oxygen, we can multiply that, of course, by our uh, flow in volume and the weight of water to find out how many pounds of material are we, how many pounds of um, pollutants do we need to treat with oxygen. And that can give us an idea of how much oxygen we need, which is important to know to, uh, to maintain the dissolved oxygen level. But as we, as we you know, look at this important parameter, what is, what is dissolved oxygen and how does it relate to how much oxygen we're putting into our, um, our basins? So dissolved oxygen is the milligrams of free oxygen per liter of water. It's a concentration at a moment of time. So we're also thinking about oxygen transfer rate. So in order to maintain a target oxygen concentration, the amount of oxygen that we're putting in from our blower systems or or our surface aerators or other equipment is gonna to have to match the um, biological oxygen demand that's treating the contaminants coming into our system, which that biological oxygen demand is gonna vary based on flow, um, based on the time of year, the water that's coming in. So what happens if the oxygen transfer rate is too small for the biological oxygen demand coming into the facility? we're gonna get a low oxygen concentration and we're gonna have a bad problem. It's a serious, serious issue. And of course, we wanna avoid this at all costs because this is the, the goal of our wastewater treatment systems is to avoid um, polluting the streams and um, possibly uh, causing, you know, causing the, the dead fish problem as previously mentioned. So what about this? Is this just, is this a good situation to be in? The oxygen transfer rate is greater than the BOD. So we're gonna end up with a high oxygen concentration. Well, that's all well and good, except ultimately we're gonna end up with such a high level of dissolved oxygen that the, the oxygen is gonna reach its potentially its saturation point and simply bubble off. The BOD is satisfied, but the excess oxygen is not really doing anything to further our treatment goals. And this is a problem because it costs your municipality money and it's bad for the environment. So that excess oxygen that's beyond the target concentration is wasting money and energy. Also, it could be a problem if you're looking to add uh, nutrient removal. We really have to target 
our DO rate so that we can add some anoxic and anaerobic environments for biological nutrient removal. So that's another reason. Um, but of course, as the um, energy, um, as with our energy focus, when we see uh, more oxygen than necessary added to the process, we think this is wasting energy, bad for the environment. It's something that we should target. So it's critical um, to control that aeration rate to uh, target the oxygen concentration that we're looking to obtain for optimal treatment um, as the BOD level fluctuates with various flows and various concentrations in the water coming in. So well, there's lots of sources of oxygen, not only the um, equipment that we put into our wastewater systems, but also in our anoxic zones, uh, denitrifiers can take advantage of nitrates in the water to, for a source of oxygen. So we're just talking about um, today how we control our equipment to provide that target oxygen level. Oxygen transfer rate is something that, you know, as we see how this, how dissolved oxygen level is, you know, one parameter for measuring the health of our system. We see that the rate of transfer is actually also really important since dissolved oxygen is really a moment in time. So another way that we often measure um, oxygen transfer is the oxidation reduction potential or ORP. And that's something that Sean will get into more when we discuss ways to control aeration, but we wanted to mention it here as we're thinking about how important it is for us to think about the rate at which um, the oxygen is entering and leaving the wastewater. So aside from just um, maintaining adequate oxygen for BOD, we also need to consider other reasons that we include aeration. Otherwise we might, we might provide insufficient aeration or run into a problem where we're trying to reduce too much and we need it for another reason. So one is nitrification or the breakdown of ammonia into nitrate. Like I mentioned before, there's, there's um, or I'm sorry, nitrate and nitrate, that there's, um, there's less um, nitrogen in the water than um, carbon, but it actually requires quite a bit more oxygen per unit. So well we, so well we require only um, a few parts of oxygen per to break down one part of carbon, it's quite a bit more, I think four or five times more for ammonia. Then, um, so this can be a significant demand. And we call this the chemical oxygen demand. The second set of nitrate nitrification, which converts nitrate into nitrate, also requires oxygen. And then mixing or maintaining this is the suspension of materials. This is a critical step as we need to, we need the, the bugs that are doing the work, the oxygen and the contaminants to all be in the same place so they can do their work. So we need to mix up the wastewater. So even if we're talking about anoxic zones, we're gonna be adding mixers. Um, and in our aerobic zones, uh, we need to consider the fact that our aeration systems are mixing. So that's a critical aspect also of aeration. Oh, and here, I'm sorry, I, I, this is, I was trying to jump ahead of myself, relative oxygen demand. So this is something that we want to think about when we look at not only the ratio of those contaminants coming in, so we've got a lot of uh, carbonaceous BOD coming in that 100 to five to one in terms of um, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. But the nitrogenous, um, you need 4.6 pounds of oxygen per nitrogenous BOD. So quite a bit more oxygen required to convert ammonia into nitrates. So that's something to consider. And then when we start thinking about biological nutrient removal, an important thing to note and to be aware of is that denitrification, where we break down those nitrates into nitrogen um, and um, so that, it's, it, that it can harmlessly bubble off, that it actually uses the oxygen from the NO2 and the NO3, those are the nitrates, um, to, to uh, provide itself the oxygen. So that's why we need that um, anaero the anoxic environment where um, you know, the bugs, if there was free oxygen, they wouldn't bother to go to the trouble 
as it were, of to denitrify. But when there's not free oxygen, they're going to start um, they're going to start taking advantage of the oxygen that's bound up in the nitrates. So denitrification actually provides almost three pounds of O2 per pound of nitrate. So that's actually a source of oxygen. Um, so note that negative there. But before you get to that point, um, you know, we're going to need to provide quite a bit of, of oxygen to take care of the carbonaceous BOD and also to uh, nitrify the ammonia. So now that we know um, a little bit about why we provide oxygen, what it's for, and some of the reasons why we need to target um, a set a very precise amount of oxygen to our biological oxygen demand and our chemical oxygen demand. I think we'll jump to a quick poll question, um, a couple of questions just to see if we're all on the same page. Um, if you can throw that up, Sean. Yeah, so in what metric is DO most commonly measured? This is probably kind of an easy question for you all who are doing it on a regular basis, but uh, just make sure everyone's still awake. And then why is excessive dissolved oxygen a problem? Why might be a, it be a problem to provide too much oxygen to your basins? Awesome. Well, here, oh, we still got a couple more answers trickling in. There, as expected, uh, the first one was pretty easy for you all, uh, milligrams per liter. So we usually, um, I guess we could hypothetically measure uh, dissolved oxygen in pounds per gallon, but generally it's milligrams per liter uh, is the concentration. And then the reason that excessive DO is a problem um, is primarily for us with our focus on energy, excessive DO waste energy and it increases the cost um, to plants of treating wastewater. And then I think one that's gonna become increasingly important is we were looking for two right answers here, um, that excessive DO can carry over into denitrifying zones. And that's gonna become increasingly important as we look to add denitrification in all our plants. So thank you so much for um, for listening. And I, with that, I will pass it to Sean to talk about some of the technology that we use to um, aerate our, our systems and also how we control those. Okay, thank you, Jane. Mm -hmm. uh, so as Jane commented on, um, we've touched a little bit on why we add DO to our systems and, and why specific controls needed. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about how to efficiently get that oxygen into your wastewater streams. So first thing we kind of look at is kind of early um, aeration systems or just surface aerators. If you can splash that water up into the air, you increase the surface area of the water in contact with the air and that increases its oxygen absorption rate. Then that mixes back into your basins and that's how you get um, overall oxygenation for your processes. Um, so horizontal rotors are very common on oxidation ditches and vertical splash uh, aeration systems, either spraying that water up into the air or using a turbine um, to mix that water and splash it up um, are kind of the earliest versions of, of aeration technologies. Um, horizontal aspirators were something that came along a little bit later. Um, the main reason was a way to combat uh, kind of the, the dirtiness that comes from splashing wastewater into the air. Um, it's one of the downsides to a surface aerator is that they can splash that, that wastewater into the air and you're releasing those contaminants uh, into an area where they can become aerosolized. Um, and it also uh, allows them to splash onto other surfaces and cause corrosion, things like that. Um, so, you know, kind of the quick pros of those surface aerators, there's fast installation. You don't have to do uh, drain down a basin and install these uh, diffusers along the bottom or anything like that. Uh, there's no piping to connect to them. It's just the motors and the splashing devices or the, the mixers. Um, they're a lower capital cost, so they, they tend to be very common for smaller plants. Um, they're easy to move around. Um, it's probably more of a, a pro for lagoons than it is for um, activated sludge plants, but uh, we have seen with oxidation ditches that they find that 
know, shifting the location around of a, an aspirating mixer or something like that uh, can improve performance. And it's easy to do with a surface mounted unit. Um, they're also more resistant to biofouling since they're constantly moving. There's, there's shear on those surfaces that kind of strips off any kind of biological contaminants that might be adhering to them uh, that would otherwise reduce their effectiveness. Um, also, since you're just splashing water into the air um, for uh, a lot of surface mixers to get that oxygen dissolved into the water, there's no risk of biofouling for those particular systems. Um, but on the negative side, uh, they are much more maintenance intensive. Most of these have gearboxes that need to be oiled or greased. Um, they have much uh, the lowest aeration efficiency of aeration technologies, um, mainly because they're mixing oxygen near the surface of the water, but deep basins, you know, that those deeper levels don't necessarily see the higher DO levels. It's not an even distribution. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, you've got that aerosolization of wastewater in the air for surface splashers and things like that. That can create a health concern, um, but the main thing there is uh, you're also splashing it on surfaces that can then cause corrosion. It just increases your overall maintenance and upkeep for these systems. Um, but the big thing for us as far as, you know, the energy conservation is that these systems have that lower aeration efficiency uh, in the range of somewhere between 0.5 to 2 pounds of oxygen per horsepower of aerator. Um, and that's including the alpha factors that account for um, biofouling of those systems. So kind of the next upgrade was to go to a subsurface aeration device. If you can get that oxygen into the bottom of the water, have it raising from the bottom up, you've got a more even uh, oxygen concentration throughout the water column. It's a little bit more efficient. Um, also, instead of having a bubble with a small surface area in the air absorbing oxygen, you've got the reverse. You've got a bubble of oxygen um, with the surface area in the water column. So you get a little bit more better transfer efficiency that way um, as far as oxygen contact with the water versus water contact with the air. Um, and there's generally these two different types for subsurface aeration, of course, bubble and fine bubble. Um, fine bubble has about six times the surface area uh, for the equivalent volume of course bubble. So it has that increase in oxygen transfer efficiency, but there are some trade-offs to consider. So we'll look at course bubble first. Um, there are a number of different layouts that are used for course bubble aerators, um, but they provide about 1% per meter of depth of oxygen transfer efficiency to about 3% per meter. Um, depending on how those diffusers are laid out, what the water circulation patterns are in your basins. Um, probably one of the earliest ones, it was developed primarily to maintain mixing and, and drive uh, flow throughout a basin, was the spiral roll diffusion pattern. So you got aerators on one side of the basin, uh, they could be generators that are blowing across the bottom and then mixing up the opposite side, um, or uh, a disc diffuser or tubular diffuser that as the air column, the bubbles rise over the diffuser that also lifts water. That uplift then creates a circulation throughout the basin that maintains mixing, keeps your solids in suspension. Um, unfortunately, what happens with those is because you've got that rapid column of rise right over your air source, um, that carries those bubbles up quickly to the surface where the bubbles then escape into the atmosphere, you don't have as high oxygen transfer efficiency. So these are some of the, the lower oxygen transfer efficiency options for coarse bubble uh, basins. Um, so about 1.4 pounds O2 per horsepower. Uh, the kind of the next upgrade we moved towards was a spiral roll where you had either two rows down the center of a basin, you had opposing rolls or two uh, strips of aerators on the edges of the basin, then you had converging rolls of water. And this was mainly done to improve the mixing efficiency of the aeration systems, but they have about the same uh, oxygen transfer efficiency. It's a little bit better, um, but about the same as spiral roll. And again, it's because you've got that rapid uplift of bubbles right over the diffusers, carries that oxygen right to the surface of the water. Um, the optimal for, for course bubble as far as aeration efficiency and energy efficiency was full floor coverage. Um, what you've got here is multiple columns of bubbles um, interrupting that, that circulating flow of water and that slows the rate of how quickly those bubbles reach the surface. So they've got more time to transfer oxygen through the, that membrane between the, the air and the water so that you increase that transfer efficiency. 
We're looking at uh, coarse bubble aeration, the pros of it, you get more mixing per bubble because you've got a large volume moving up through the water. You're contacting more uh, volume of water as you move through it with that larger bubble. So you get better mixing than you do with fine bubble uh, aeration uh, in most situations. Uh, also, since the pores on those devices are larger, you get uh, less prone to fouling, less prone to maintenance issues and wear of those aerators that are in the your basin. Um, and it's kind of that mid-grade efficiency between surface aeration and fine bubble. You get some improvements, you get to reduce how much horsepower you've got installed to drive that aeration. Um, but they are less efficient than fine bubble and other um, means of aeration under the surface. Um, certain configurations, as we noted with the spiral roll and do roll, do reduce that transfer efficiency in preference for mixing. Um, usually see that with, with uh, higher solids content in, in wastewater systems. Um, I've got one. They are more, that should be in the pros column. <laughs> uh, but they do have that faster bubble rise as well. Those larger bubbles rise faster. Um, and so you don't have as much time in contact with the water to transfer air. Um, and again, usually we see that selection for coarse bubble is usually for higher solids content um, where you're more focused on mixing that basin and maintaining solids in suspension um, and not necessarily so concerned with the aeration efficiency of the system. Um, but then looking at fine bubble, uh, this has the highest oxygen transfer rate for bubbling systems and clean water. Um, but once you add the dirtiness and biofouling that happens, uh, those alpha factors do drop that efficiency uh, significantly. Uh, so you go from, despite having six times the contact area, which you would think is six times the oxygen transfer rate, with those fouling factors in the water and stuff, it actually reduces that uh, to somewhere between two to three times the transfer efficiency of a coarse bubble system um, with a standard density uh, air diffuser pattern. What we have seen, again, combating these circulating uh, columns of water and that lift that happens with bubbles rising in a column, with high density systems, you can increase that efficiency a little bit more and get about four times the efficiency of coarse bubble. Um, but these are a little more maintenance intensive, usually need some kind of cleaning every six months to two years, depending on the type of diffuser you're using. Um, and you've got a little bit less mixing capability with the smaller bubbles. Again, with that smaller volume rising through the water, each individual bubble has less ability to mix and maintain solid suspension because they're not contacting as many things as they rise through that water column. Uh, so there is usually a little bit of trade off there, although with proper design, uh, fine bubble diffusion can maintain mixing. And it's usually through that high density setup. Um, so the pros, you've got that slow bubble rise that increases your oxygen transfer efficiency. You've got a large reduction in aeration power and energy consumption, but you do have that trade off of increased maintenance and upkeep of those systems and mixing capability. And then one of the newest technologies that's coming out is membrane aeration. Um, these have oxygen transfer rates that are up to about 20 pounds of O2 per horsepower. Um, the main reason these are so much more efficient than bubbling systems is if you look at the surface of any aeration basin that's using a diffuser system, you always see bubbles rise to the surface and escape. And that's wasted oxygen uh, transfer potential. Uh, with these membrane systems, a biofilm grows straight on the membrane and then oxygen diffuses through the membrane to the biofilm. So there's, there's no bubbles that rise out that waste that kind of energy um, that are wasting that transfer of oxygen. You've got this direct combination of the biofilm that's needing the oxygen growing right on the surface that's providing that oxygen source. And that's where that large efficiency increase comes from. Um, on the downside though, since you don't have any bubbling in the system, you don't have any mixing to maintain those solids in suspension to get materials up into that biofilm where they're going to be broken down by the microbes and in contact with the oxygen that's being supplied. So a lot of these do have to have supplemental mixers added into the basins to maintain that suspension of solids and maintain contact of the microbes with the materials that we're trying to break down. Um, but these are really great for simultaneous nitrification and denitrification because as that biofilm thickness grows, the layer right against the membrane is getting the oxygen. That's doing your your nitrification steps. But the thicker biofilm that's out away from the surface is in a, an anoxic zone essentially. And so that's able to do denitrification 
in the same basin in the same local area. Um, and another big benefit to these is that you're supplying air pretty close to atmospheric pressure instead of combating the depth of your basin. Um, because you're diffusing oxygen across a membrane rather than forcing it up through the column of water, um, that greatly reduces how much horsepower you need to drive that head pressure of air through the water column. And so you're reducing that, that head pressure discharge from, depending on the depth of your basin, somewhere between 8 PSI and 18 PSI, down to somewhere between 2 to 3 PSI. Um, that's a big energy savings. So on the pro side, you've got no bubbles, so you've got no loss of that energy to the atmosphere as far as your oxygen that you're trying to deliver. Um, you've got a very small footprint where you can do simultaneous nitrification and denitrification in the same location instead of having to have separated zones of a basin uh, like with typical uh, systems. And you've got that very low pressure for distributing that air to the membrane, which reduces your horsepower requirements. On the negative side, you do have to provide supplemental mixing, which can be a trade-off with your uh, the energy savings from aeration. And you've got to have a means of controlling that biofilm thickness so it doesn't get out of control and interrupt your treatment process where it can block the flow of water up into the membrane um, for mixing purposes. And you can also end up with an anaerobic condition if that biofilm gets too thick, uh, that can also cause some issues. So you do have to have some supplemental aeration outside of those biofilms that add some kind of shearing to maintain the thickness of that biofilm, which again is a little bit of a trade-off with that aeration energy for another purpose. So before we go on to how we actually measure and control our aeration processes, we do have another poll here. Launch that. First question is, what are the main detriments of surface aerators? Uh, so we've got a couple options there. And then which subsurface aeration pattern offers that best pounds of oxygen per horsepower efficiency? So we'll leave that up for a few seconds, give you all a chance to answer. I don't see that we've had any questions come in yet, but if you do have questions, please feel free to enter those into that Q&A window and we will answer those as we are able. Okay, looks like we've got most of our answers in here. So we'll share those results. So the first question, all the above. Um, those surface aerators, you've got the aerosolization of water that can be uh, a maintenance concern and a health concern for operators. Um, they've got that lower aeration efficiency, more frequent maintenance intervals, mainly because of those gearboxes and oil changes, things like that. Um, so all of those are reasons where it's a main detriment of those surface aeration systems over a subsurface system. Um, for the subsurface aeration pattern, that high density coverage gives you the most uh, uh, oxygen transfer efficiency. And we see that usually with fine bubble. If you're doing full floor coverage for coarse bubble, that could be a correct answer there as well. Uh, but the uh, high density coverage is uh, the most efficient aeration pattern. So. All right. So now we'll move on to um, control and measurement of DO. So for direct measurement of dissolved oxygen, um, there are two main types of chemical sensors and there's subtypes of each of these. Um, but mainly you've got an electrochemical sensor that has some kind of galvanic reaction with oxygen in the water that's then converted into a current that is measurable by a device and converted into a, a dissolved oxygen content. Um, but these do require flow over them. So they've generally got a filter in place that can be clogged over time. Um, by the flow of, of wastewater through that sensor. So it does have a little bit higher um, maintenance intervals than if you went with an optical sensor uh, where you've got light shining on a fluorescing material. As that light dims, that gets transferred into an electrical signal that is then read as uh, a DO reading. Um, these don't require flow across the meter. So they're a little bit more resilient uh, than a dissolved oxygen sensor. Although, um, the individual replacement cost is a little bit higher as you're usually replacing that entire sensor head once that fluorescing material is degraded, uh, where with that dissolved oxygen sensor, 
the electrochemical ones, you're just replacing a couple of electrodes in those instead of the entire sensing head. Um, and so it's a little bit here, again, looking at what are the trade-offs for your system? Are you wanting to get away from uh, maintenance intensive intervals for a little bit more uh, replacement cost for that sensor? Or are you okay with a lower cost, but more frequent replacement intervals? So um, there's proponents for both of these, kind of goes back and forth, uh, but the trade-offs are fairly equal between them. As Jane mentioned, one of the other things we can look at is oxidation reduction potential. Um, and this comes more into play when we're doing uh, nutrient removal processes rather than just maintaining biological oxygen demand. Um, so if you're doing an anaerobic zone and an anoxic zone, you're, you're wanting to measure a little bit more in depth than just what the DO level is. And so this ORP sensor gives you a sense of uh, for the positive value, that's how much oxygen is in the water, what that oxidizing potential is. As the oxygen gets depleted, and now that water is absorbing electrons from things, it's getting into the anaerobic state, now you're in what's a, called a reduction potential. Uh, so it's able to measure both of those through uh, a change in voltage across electrodes that are submerged in the fluid. Um, and so <clears throat> what you're looking at here is just a little bit more in-depth measurement of what the conditions are within your basins uh, for a little bit more fine control when you're looking at enhanced nutrient removal processes. So you've got these sensors in your basin, how are those actually tied back to your DO control or your, your aeration systems? Um, there are manual methods where you've got a, a DO sensor installed, you're taking periodic readings, if your DO is high, you go make a manual adjustment. Over time, you figure out kind of what your loading patterns are for your plant. And so you set up either timers that, you know, you, you aerate for a little bit and then let it de-aerate, go through cycles like that. Uh, <clears throat> or you go with a VFD that gives you kind of a fixed speed. You, you set that setting to whatever you need it to be to maintain that kind of uh, aerated delivery rate. Uh, that you need to meet your peak loads, but you over aerate a little bit through the day. Uh, so these aren't the most efficient control methods doing it manually, uh, but they are kind of the low cost options. And then there's fully automated control where you've got a VFD on the blower and some other control system to individual basins, either through valving uh, or individual blowers to each basin, where you're, you're controlling to more specific DO levels. Um, and typically we see those for uh, plants that are doing more enhanced nutrient removal processes. So looking at time clocks, uh, a lot of times we see these for uh, aerobic digesters in particular. Um, and they're also used for specific uh, treatment processes like sequence batch, sequence batch reactors. Uh, although often those are also paired with a DO sensor or ORP sensors um, to regulate that, that timing signal. Um, but a lot of times what we'll see is you'll over aerate a little bit, hit that higher deal level. Once you hit an upper set point, um, you figure out what that time period is. Then you've got the timer set to be off for a certain period. You know what that drawdown rate is. And you go through cycles of on for an hour, off for a couple hours um, with a timer system. Um, and this does take a little bit of, you know, for new plants, it's trial and error to figure out what your rates are. And you're just, you know, kind of hitting that minimum between capital costs of installing these timer systems versus a full SCADA control system um, and trading off with that energy consumption and, and uh, of the system. Uh, we do also see where these timer systems are tied into a SCADA system and instead of having a manual timer, you've got an automated timing system. Um, again, looking at like sequence batch reactors. Um, where the timing of aeration signals is adjusted by the SCADA system based on the load that's sensed by a DO sensor or an ORP meter. Um, as you're hitting a, an upper limit, it turns the system off. And then as it hits a lower limit, it turns the system back on. Uh, variable frequency drives gives you a little bit more control than with an on-off control system. Um, because you're ramping motors, you've got a little bit less maintenance wear and tear on the aeration blower systems. Um, the simplest approach to a VFD is simply to manually set it at a rate that aerates for your peak load so that you're meeting your permit, um, but then you're over aerating for your lower demand periods. 
Uh, it's not optimal, but it's better than having no control and constantly over aerating. Um, kind of the optimal setup is you've got uh, SCADA controls that are tied into that VFD that's going to adjust its speed based on the demand that's sensed by your DO sensor or your ORP sensors uh, or a combination of the two. And so these are better at maintaining a fixed DO level as long as you're within the turndown range of your blower system. Looking at the blower itself and optimizing efficiency on the supply side for that air, you know, we've looked at the, the submerged part where you're delivering oxygen into the water and how to make that efficient. Now we got to look at how to send that oxygen efficiently to those aerators. Um, for surface aerators, that there's there's nothing to send. They're right there on the surface, mixing water with, with air, getting it in contact, and that's sending your uh, oxygen into your basin. But when you've got um, diffusers, subsurface aeration systems, um, you've got a blower that's associated with those. Um, and so you've got positive displacement blowers that are a little bit lower efficiency, but they tend to have a bit more turn down capacity. Um, so you've got reciprocating systems that are very uncommon, uh, but we've actually run across one here recently. Um, rotary lobes, very common as a low cost option. Uh, and screw compressors, it's a little bit more efficiency there, a little bit less noise and heat generation, a little bit uh, less maintenance. Uh, and then you've got centrifugal systems. They're higher efficiency, but they typically have a little bit less turn down capacity for deep basins. Uh, you're looking at multi-stage centrifugal blowers and turbo blowers there. So just taking a quick look at positive displacement blowers, that top picture there is a reciprocating piston blower system that we ran across recently. Very, very uncommon. Um, the main reasons are it's really maintenance intensive. They generate a lot of heat, which is hard on those motors, requires a lot of ventilation air through the system to control that. Um, they do have decent efficiency overall, somewhere between 70 to 85%. Um, had difficulty finding that for these larger systems. Most of that efficiency that we found was for small reciprocating compressors for like pneumatic control systems. Um, but you can assume somewhat similar efficiency for a larger system that's scaled up. Um, however, because of the excessive heat that these generate, uh, their turn down efficiency as far as slowing down the speed of those compressors uh, and slowing down your cubic feet per minute of airflow is very difficult and it limits their turn down significantly. Um, so about 50% in optimal conditions, um, the facility that we ran across um, due to the overheating uh, in that space, probably not less than about maybe 70, 75% uh, reduction in speed before those motors aren't removing heat from that space enough with the discharge of air um, to cool themselves down. And then you got an overheating problem for the motors and for um, the reciprocating pistons. Uh, rotary blowers, um, what we tend to see now, a little bit more common is a three lobe system. Um, older units like the one in the bottom picture there might be a two lobe um, system. Um, what you see with fewer lobes is more vibration, uh, which is a, a maintenance issue for maintaining um, the piping networks that connect your blower to your diffusers. Um, the three lobes reduces that vibration a little bit. You get a little bit better efficiency. Uh, so somewhere between 45 and 70%, depending on the number of lobes and your, the setup of your system. Uh, time of year can also have an impact on that as uh, density of air changes. And again, you're looking at somewhere around a 50% turndown. Uh, again, mostly limited by heat generation in the space and not necessarily by issues like surge or something like that. Um, Usually it's heat dissipation that's limiting this turn down speed for these rotary blowers. Um, the next step up is a rotary screw blower. You get a little bit more continuous uh, delivery of air. Uh, so you get a little bit less vibration. Um, so you get a little bit more efficiency out of those 65 to 75% uh, aeration efficiency and your turn downs are about the same. Again, you're limited by that heat dissipation usually and overheating the motor and not necessarily any kind of pressure requirements or flow requirements in your system. Looking at centrifugal blowers, uh, the big thing here is you're reducing vibration significantly because you've got continuous delivery of air instead of uh, rotational cycles. Um, so they are uh, for centrifugal blowers, you're looking at uh, single stage or multi-stage blowers, uh, like in the top picture here, have a, a really high efficiency, 70 to 80% at their design delivery rate. 
Uh, so you got lower noise, lower heat generation, but the individual turndown on these is limited by head pressure requirements um, because as you slow these centrifugal systems down, you also reduce their output head pressure. Um, and so that can impact how much you can turn these down. And while you can, with a, a decent system, get somewhere around a 50% turndown rate, we typically see that normal is somewhere between a 20 and 30% turndown, um, limited by that head pressure requirement. You've got a similar thing for turbo blowers, um, a little bit higher efficiency, 75 to 85% um, with that turbine setup. Um, depending on the bearing that you've got installed in those has an impact on how much you can turn down these systems. Um, if you've got a magnetic bearing, usually you're going to be limited solely by the head pressure requirements of the system. As you decrease the speed, you decrease the head that it can supply. And, uh, and so you've got a limit there where you've got to overcome that head pressure of your basin to get those bubbles rising out through the surface. Um, if you've got an air bearing though, you limit that turn down a little bit more because the air that's being generated by that uh, turbine is also generating the cushion uh, as the air bearing that maintains that shaft um, spinning freely for that turbine. If you slow down that air too much, that shaft can sag and now you're, you know, it can potentially contact surfaces and cause additional wear on that system. So they do have minimum speeds that maintain that, uh, that air pressure needed for the air bearing as well. So just understanding the difference between positive displacement and centrifugal blowers. Positive displacement blowers, you've got a nearly one-to-one -one power reduction to speed ratio. It's very intuitive. If you need 20% of your capacity, you slow down, or if you need 80% of your capacity, you're going to slow down to 80% of your speed. Um, so as noted here, 20% speed reduction equals a 20% power reduction. Um, so just looking at your overall energy consumption, it's intuitive to understand if I reduce it by X amount, I'm going to get X power reduction out of this motor uh, for the most part. Uh, with centrifugal systems and those, uh, they follow the fan affinity laws. So if you slow down the speed, you get a cubic ratio between that speed reduction and the power draw of that system. So a 20% speed reduction gets you about a 52% reduction in power from the motor. Um, but the other thing to be aware of is you're also reducing that pressure output from that system as well. Um, so it's a little bit more complex and less intuitive for a centrifugal system understanding the interaction between adjusting the speed of that system, the impact on energy, and the impact on your output pressure. Um, and so that's what we're touching on here. The depth of your aerator set is going to set that minimum head pressure requirement for your system. With positive displacement, it doesn't matter what that depth is. They push out a fixed volume of air. The output pressure matches that head pressure regardless of what it is. Um, the only difference is it slightly increases your energy consumption to overcome that pressure and push that air into the system. Um, however, with a centrifugal system where speed was linked to power by a cubic ratio, it's linked to pressure by a squared ratio. And so as you're turning down the system, if you get a 20% reduction in your uh, speed, you're looking at around a That's right. Let me do the math real quick. Yeah. So you're looking at around um, a uh, where you're going from a 20% reduction to a 50% reduction in power. You're going from a 20% reduction in speed to around a 35, 40% reduction in your head pressure. Um, so that's really important to consider when sizing your blowers. Um, and again, heat dissipation can be a limiter for centrifugal systems as well, although it's mainly the concern for those positive displacement systems. Most of these you're gonna see end up with about a 50% turn down per blower um, during most conditions. So how do you optimize that turn down ratio? If you can only get at most for any system, it's somewhere around a 50% turndown on an individual blower. Um, what's recommended by most designers is an eight to one turndown ratio to optimize efficiency for plants that have varying loads. Um, a lot of times what we see is you've got three equally sized blowers. 
um, with that 50% turndown, that gives you about a four to one turndown ratio because you've got a standby blower and then two that are actively meeting your system demands. Um, so what we're showing on the chart here are different options of sizing your blowers and combining them together to get different turndown ratios and that impact that that has on your aeration efficiency. Um, the second column there is those two equally sized units sized to 100% of your flow. They've got a, about a 50% turndown ratio. <clears throat> uh, sorry, that's the third column. No, I was right. First one is the two systems sized at 100% of your flow. You can get about a 50% turndown. So you get somewhere around 50% savings over a unit that's running 24 seven at full speed. Um, if you've got three units, each of them sized at 50%, that way if one goes down, you've still got the ability to supply the full uh, airflow that your uh, plant needs at peak design. Um, but you've got a little bit more turndown ratio, you've got that four to one. So it's about a quarter of the speed uh, energy draw um, of a system that's running 24 seven at full capacity. But what if you take one of those um, 50% size units and turn it into two 25% sized units. You've got a little bit more turn down capacity there, but again, with the way plant loads work out, um, if you're at your peak loads most of the time, you're not going to be using that 25% sized blower very much. And so there's not a lot of savings there. However, if your concentrations vary a lot, which is what the last bar is showing here, it's about an 80% concentration, uh, you do get a little bit more savings um, tied to that system because you're going to be using that 25% capacity blower a little bit more, saving on that energy consumption. And we did have a quick poll question here. We just want to know what kind of blowers do you have at your system? Um, if you've got none, you've got a surface aerator of some sort, a horizontal splashing one or a vertical splashing turbine. Um, if you've got blowers, there's the reciprocating type, rotary lobe, um, the screw or hybrid, um, positive displacement systems, and then you've got the centrifugal for multi-stage or turbo blower systems. And if you have another type of aeration system like uh, uh, we see for outfalls, uh, sometimes we see a, a cascade system for aeration, um, then please do let us know. Okay, looks like we got most of our answers in. We'll share those results. Looks like most people have centrifugal blower systems. Um, we do find those, uh, those positive displacement ones tend to be on those smaller plants, so. All right. So just to wrap up some of our key takeaways, on the air distribution side, you increase your efficiency with fine bubble aeration. Um, emerging membrane technologies may drive this even lower as we go uh, into the future. Oh, sorry, we're still sharing the poll there. Um, subsurface aerations, you know, it's beneficial um, over surface aeration in that efficiency regard, uh, but surface aeration can be beneficial for plants that are a little bit more concerned about those upfront costs um, and the ability to shift equipment around. Next step in uh, energy efficiency for your systems is being able to control those. Um, DO sensors and ORP sensors, tying those into SCADA systems and tying those into your blower systems, uh, increasing the efficiency as far as measuring what your demand is. And then finally, increasing that efficiency overall through the supply of air with uh, positive displacement blowers, centrifugal blowers. Um, what we see uh, for plants now that are trying to target that eight to one turndown ratio is they'll have the centrifugal blowers because they operate at peak efficiency at their design peak demands. And then they switch to a positive displacement blower because those are more efficient than the centrifugal blowers at lower demands. Um, and so it's a good way to get that eight to one turn down ratio. Um, and you balance a little bit the capital cost for an expensive centrifugal system with a less expensive positive displacement system. Um, and so just a little bit of homework that we've uh, decided to assign you all. Um, if you can go back to your plant, calculate your, your hours per day or the speed of your aeration need uh, to justify your uh, 
uh, to satisfy your, your BOD uh, demands. Um, check the DO at various parts of your system. See if you're hitting uh, those targets, usually somewhere around two parts per million, uh, two milligrams per liter. Um, and then do you have the ability to adjust those aeration settings? And if you don't want to do that homework, reach out to us, contact us for an assessment. We'll be happy to do that homework for you. And John, we have a couple of great questions and some excellent comments coming into the Q&A. If I know we're kind of, we're right here on 12 o'clock, but just want to mention if people haven't haven't checked them out, there's some good questions. So maybe we'll follow up with those or hang on a couple minutes. Uh, so we do have a comment here about uh, air bearings for turbo blowers mm -hmm. uh, down south. Um, air filtration on those is very important because you can get uh, negative impacts if you're getting debris blown into that that air bearing that can clog the system up cause issues so very important yes um, yeah. probably the one thing we didn't actually touch on here as far as efficiency was filtering that incoming air and making sure that you've got clean air going into that blower system also very important and then also ammonia based aeration controls which is a great emerging technology especially where uh, denitrification and nitrification are um, are targeted so that's a great comment and then a couple questions. Was there an example of membrane aeration in Illinois? Um, and I, I saw Gurney, I'll put it, I put it in the chat. Um, they did a fine bubble and membrane system in 2019, but I don't know if you know of any, Sean. Uh, not off the top of my head, no. Um, I do know there are alternate systems. They're not necessarily membrane systems, um, but they are um, rotary biological contactors, which um, you've got a similar setup where the biofilm is adhering to a membrane, but then that membrane is being rotated up into the air for oxygenation and then back down into the, the wastewater stream. So it's a little bit different than, than the uh, diffusion membrane technologies. But. And then a question of, have you seen any plants with issues of cycling blowers on and off like six to 12 times per day? Is Frequently, that yes. Um, particularly in plants that are oversized for their load. Um, they're either over aerating or if they're trying to, to reduce aeration to control other things. I know over aerating can lead to uh, filamentous bacterial growth, uh, which can cause issues with settling and uh, sludge thickening. Um, then yeah, they can, they can certainly see rapid cycling and VFDs can help correct that to some extent, but then proper sizing of the blowers is probably the more beneficial option there. Yeah, and if you're considering, uh, you know, whether you can, if you have got an oversized blower, trying to consider whether you could add time clocks, um, it might be something to discuss with the blower manufacturer. Is it going to be acceptable for that equipment to turn on and off? We did get a comment about ultra fine pore membranes as well that came in. Um, this is kind of along the same lines as fine bubble aeration, uh, except they produce ultra fine bubbles. So you get even smaller volume of bubbles. You got that greater surface area uh, to volume ratio. So you get a little bit more efficiency out of those. Slower bubble rise again increases that transfer efficiency. But again, you're trading off that mixing value for the individual bubbles. So it tends to uh, require some additional mixing with those. And a great comment here, somebody put in the chat, because I think this is the bottom line for controlling aeration. Most plants and infrastructure is way over designed. And that's of, it's it's almost it's by necessity because we need to design for that uh, 90 degree summer day with the highest flows possible. Um, so most of the time our, our equipment is oversized. So that's that's where the real importance of controlling aeration comes in. Mm -hmm. And uh, Robert said, my plants blowers shut down several times a day with no issues. So, you know, it might depend on your blowers, but, um, you know, that's something to to be aware of. You know, it's every system is different. Yeah. And, you know, shutting down several times a day, you know, if you're somewhere in a three to four, as long as you're not shutting down, you know, the blower comes on, runs for 15 minutes and then is off for 15 minutes. As long as you're not short cycling like that, where you're getting multiple cycles, um, you're likely not to see a large detriment um, in the wear on the motors um, and maintenance. Um, but if you are um, seeing 
really short cycle periods for those aeration systems, uh, particularly if you've got automated controls that are cycling them on and off. Um, and you will probably want to look into properly sizing those blowers and increasing those run times to reduce those cycle rates. Oh, and another comment, uh, affinity laws, super critical. So, you know, we touched upon it a little bit with centrifugal blowers, but that's also, you know, that's going to be something to, to really keep in mind that 20% reduction, it's about a 35% reduction in head and a 52% uh, reduction in power. So that's really powerful way to save energy um, at your plant if you can take advantage of those affinity laws. Mm -hmm. Well, and with that, um, I think we're, we're a little after 12 o'clock now, so... Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, we really appreciate it. And please, uh, please do come back for our upcoming uh, webinars and uh, just spread the word. We've got one uh, especially focused on lagoon aeration fundamentals. And then we'll be talking about um, the uh, oxygen transfer efficiency. We touched on that a little bit in this fundamentals one, but we're going to really dig into it um, in this upcoming webinar. So I hope you can join us. And thanks again. Thank you, Jane. Yes, that webinar for activated sludge plants is on November 16th, uh, Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Um, so please join us. I'll send out the registration link. Again, today's session is recorded. Um, we will provide the recording and the slides after the session has been completed. Uh, we will also get those certificates out as soon as we can. And we get when we get the CEU course number, we'll send it out to you as well. Thank you so much, Jane and Sean, for your awesome presentation today. I hope you all enjoyed it and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.